Amen. Father, we bless your name this morning. We'd like to give you this time of worship. May we worship you with a whole heart. You're our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Standing here in your presence, thinking of the good things you have done. Waiting here patiently just to hear your still small voice again. Only righteous, faithful to the end. Savior, healer, redeemer, and friend. I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for back by your blood. There is a name older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation. Jesus There is a light that overwhelms the darkness. There is a kingdom that forever reigns. There is freedom from the chains that bind us. Jesus, Jesus, who was on the wall.
in the heavens can be compared to the Lord, and who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto him? There is no one like you, Lord. The government rests upon your shoulders. You rule all things, and you're our God, and you're with us, and you walk with us through the fire, through the floods, and through the waters. Lo, I am with you unto the end of the age, you tell us. Thank you, Lord. You're our God. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me.
you've redeemed us from the curse of the law. You brought us back, Lord. You brought us back from the grave. Jesus, you have set us free, free from the chains of death and hell, free from any demonic oppression, free from the prince of the power of the air. Lord, you lead us another way, in another current, the same streams that cause the city of God to rejoice. Thank you for this living water, this well of water springing up into everlasting life. And help us even now at this moment, this second, to count our many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Salvation, forgiveness of every sin, so that we can love and worship you wholeheartedly as you fill us with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for making yourself available to us. And we love that holy name, Emmanuel, God with us. You're our God. You're for us. Thank you, Lord. Let's count our blessings in a moment, quietly, just thanking God for all he's done. Okay, good morning. Welcome. Uh, I want to welcome anyone who's here for the very first time. So if you are a guest with us today, would you uh, raise your hand and just allow us to bring you something this morning? Anyone here for the very first time in our service today? Okay, well, if you... Really? Can you find one? No? Okay. Uh, if you'd like to uh, get one of those things and you're here for the first time, you can go to the Welcome Center. Also, uh, later in the offering, we'll be taking a special... Offering for missions, that's what this is for. Uh, you can put something in that if you want to, and you can uh, be sure that this will go to our missions effort worldwide. And a special thing we want to remind you about, uh, the mighty 
MBCNS, that's Maryland Bible College and Seminary, the mighty MBCNS art players. I just gave them a name. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, they will be performing for the first time anywhere on a Saturday night at 7. Is that right? 7 o'clock? 7 o'clock here in the chapel, they'll be doing The Hiding Place, which is the story of Corey Ten Boom and her family as they uh, hid um, uh, Jewish folks from uh, the Nazi occupiers during that time. So it's intense. So come out. It's free. And you can enjoy a Bible college dramatic presentation on Saturday evening. All right. Uh, this is the first uh, Sunday of February. Uh, just a reminder for those who are thinking tonight, service does begin at 630, regardless of what's going on in the other part of the world. Just a reminder, you know. Anyway. Uh, okay. This is the first s Sunday in uh, February. And uh, we are celebrating communion together today. So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, you are welcome to partake of this. And if the ushers could uh, present the elements, you can come forward and uh, we'll celebrate uh, as Jesus taught us to. Hey, good morning. Wow, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, my name is Mike Colby. Um, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything to some of you. and <laughs> Maybe it means the wrong thing to others, I don't know. <laughs> uh, my, my wife and I and our children, we are missionaries in Budapest, Hungary. Um, we're, yeah, hallelujah. We are uh, two and a half years into our stay there, two and a half years into one year of being there. Um, 
and uh, it's just a real, it's a real privilege and honor. It's like, it, uh, how did this happen? Uh, who, who knows? I, I don't know how it happened. Um, we'll take communion together in just a minute, but um, just a verse from 1 Timothy <clears throat> chapter 1. Uh, oh, before I forget, my wife said, make sure that you say hi to everybody from me. So my wife, she thinks of you guys. She talks about you. Uh, it's a Bible college girls that she spent time with. Uh, yeah. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 1. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of, of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son. Yeah, my son in the faith. Uh, I guess if I could say, you know, if I had the opportunity to say one thing, it would just be to this congregation, I would just say, like, just thank you. Like, just, man, thank you for being here. Thank you for your lives of faith. Thank you for just year, years and years of coming, serving, uh, doing a, a million little things that, that are not seen. Uh, a thousand conversations that you have with somebody in the hallway. Uh, millions of prayers that are said. Uh, just, just thank you for those. Because, because I'm your son. <laughs> and my mom is right there. There she is, my mom. That's my actual mom. It's true. <laughs> Not a metaphor. <laughs> But also, over the years, something spiritual, something that's a mystery, something that is deep, has been imparted from us to each other. Uh, and it, it's gone very deep. Uh, and it's, it's, it's in there. And you, you, know, you go through things, and there are times, and there are good times, bad times. And it's okay. And you sense deep in you. No matter what's going on, you sense a kind of like there is a hope, a hope in Christ Jesus. Where did I learn that hope? Who gave it to me? Uh, it was you. It was, it was those conversations and the prayers and, you know, uh, James Kirby. He was my principal. Amazing. He would call me into his office in the morning and talk to me. Just say, hey, come Come have a conversation with me. No, it, but it's funny, but not that conversation. <laughs> and it, it made a difference in my life. Uh, it, it was something that, that, that drew me to the Lord. And I, I look at my life, my family, and I say, wow, if it was not for this body, if it were not for those conversations, if it were not for these sons and brothers and sisters and daughters, it would not have happened. And where on earth does that happen? But it happens in the church, and it happens because of the blood of Christ. So let's just, um, you know, we'll just think about communion on that thought together, the broken body of Christ and what it produced for us. Wow, his, his brokenness in our hearts. Amazing. So let's just, let's take the, the bread together. We'll take the cup together also. And together, Lord Christ, God our Father, we just say to you, thank you for your Son. Thank you for his body and his blood, for the forgiveness of sins. 
of the impartation of a new spirit and a new life that just goes beyond uh, the natural elements, Lord. Just thank you. Thank you for this life that you've given us. Thank you for this body. In your name, amen. Um, if you can please pass your cups to the center aisle uh, that we can collect them. Yeah. Well, this is the offering, and I want to stay on that thought that we just heard from Mike. Um, yesterday, um, with a number of other members of the body, um, went to a memorial service for um, Joanne Smith's brother. And um, just like Mike said, the, it was an opportunity for me to reflect on um, what I have. Uh, Psalm 56, David, David says the statement. He says, for thou hast delivered my soul from death. Will you not deliver my feet from falling? That I may walk before God in the light of the living. And then in Psalm 116, verse 8 and 9, he says this, For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And like as we think of the offering, and I just began to reflect upon what God has done in my life and each one of our lives, he has delivered our soul from death the bondage of death, the fear of death, the control of death, how Satan uh, uses this death to control people, but Christ came and faced death head on and defeated it. And therefore, we have eternal life as a free gift. And then I thought about, because of that and this pulpit, how many times have my feet been delivered from falling? How that there's been a word in season that I've heard, that we have heard, like Mike said, the prayers and the word and the investment that literally, yes, I am saved and going to heaven, but my feet, my feet could be turned out of the way and I can fall. And how many times this pulpit has protected my feet from falling by teaching me how to think with God. And that is a beautiful thing. And, and oftentimes, like we, we think, like we live in this life, we live in the light of the living. Like, like that, is, that is missions in the light of those who not just have bios life, physical life, but eternal life. And then, like Pastor Ronaldo and Pastor Sam, we go to the lands. Like Mike in Budapest, we go to lands. And we tell people about the one who has eternal life. Who can deliver their souls from death. And their feet from falling. And so this morning, as we consider the offering the privilege, and, and think of all that God has done in your life, in our lives, that we were once lost, but we have eternal life, and that how many times our feet have been delivered from falling because of the word of God, because of the pulpit, because of the ministry, because of the decades of laboring, prayer, investment, soul winning, an encouraging phone call, and let's give this morning so that the light of the living, the vision, like light in a dark place, and then going into lands that give this message to people that they might live and be delivered from the fear of death. And the one who has the bondage of death, which is Satan. 
and realize that Christ has done it all. So with that, pray with me. It's the offering. Lord Jesus, thank you. You have delivered our souls from death. The fear, the blood was shed. Your body was broken. You paid the price. And you have done more than that. We live this life and you deliver our feet from falling through this amazing pulpit and pulpits like this around the world that preaches the finished work, that teaches us sound doctrine, that teaches us how to live, how to love, how to invest, how to serve, how to lay down our lives. Thank you, God. As Mike said, we are a grateful people. And as we give this morning, we give from a heart of thanks to you for all that you have done. Bless this offering. Use it for the furtherance of the gospel that people would understand they can live in the light of the living. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a voice that cries out in the silence, searching for a heart that will love him, and longing for a child that will give him their all, give it all, he wants it all. And there's a God that walks over the earth, he's searching for a heart that is desperate. Serve me, serve me.
All right, if you would stand, please, and greet each other. Okay, turn to uh, Romans, please. Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> Pastor Chabelli returned to uh, the States the other day, and he's, uh, uh, he's great, I think, in many ways. Right? He's a bit sick, so keep him in prayer, and uh, he'll be back. He'll be here soon, I'm sure. Uh, he is sick. What is that? Pastor Eugene, what do you call that? Pastor Dwayne, what do you call that? <laughs> Sickness. <laughs> okay, why did I ask these two guys? Because they both lived in Africa. What? Yeah, I know. I know you could. You know, it could be a long list, but you know, whatever. You know, it's typical. I mean, it happens. It's working itself out. It's working itself out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, have you ever, let's have a prayer for a moment, Lord. This is your service. We gather in unity. Thank you for those edifying words from Mike and touching our hearts. And we are in a battle in our nation. No, even in the world. Even more, we have seen the enemy in our own hearts, and we understand that we have a high calling. Encourage us in our calling today, this morning, as we are gathered here and minister to us in your name. Amen. Uh, keep your finger in Romans 6 and turn to one verse you, just for a little extra, uh, Colossians 4, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 17, and read this out loud with me. <clears throat> and say to Archippus, all right, say that with me. Is it up there? Yeah, and say to Archippus. Archie, <laughs> okay, verse 17, ready? And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Let's read it again. And say to Archippus, now Paul has gone through a litany of names in this chapter. I don't think he has any more proper names of his disciples anywhere in the scripture as in this chapter. I mean, you just run your fingers through and just, you see Tychicus, 
uh, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Mark, Barnabas, Jesus. Look at verse 11. And Jesus, which is called Justice. Why did he have his name changed? His name is Jesus, but they called him Justice. Why? Probably he didn't want to have the name of our Savior. Don't you think so? But there are people in Mexico say it called Jesus, right? The G- Jesus is used in different parts of the world. And there's a funny story. Okay, you may be seated. Basimati was in the mountains of Azerbaijan. There was a political uh, uh, contest going on. And one of the politicians was named Jesus. And Pastor Monty, they were evangelizing up in the mountains, and the, and the man, and, the, and Pastor Monty said to the man in the village, you want to accept Jesus? He said, I'm not into politics. <laughs> yeah, I am not into politics. Okay, look at verse 11. <laughs> Jesus, which is called Justice, I don't know why, but they changed his name. He was probably happy about it. Epaphras, verse 12. But now, and go on, there's Demas, uh, Nymphus is the name. Now, Archippus, take heed that what? You fulfill the ministry that you have received from the Lord. And, And that's a good word. Everyone in this room has received a ministry from the Lord. And he said, be careful that you fulfill it, that you fulfill it, isn't it? Verse 17, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you fulfill it. Some of you may know what your ministry is, that it's in Christ, and you are fulfilling it, Some of you may know and you are not fulfilling it, and some of you may not know what it is. Uh, But maybe you are fulfilling it, but you don't know it. And, of course, the other possibility, you don't know what it is and you are not fulfilling it. There's four different uh, possibilities there. So, as you... Here, more is given unto you, Mark chapter 4. Somebody mentioned this morning uh, doctrine. There are two categories of Christians in the world. Those uh, Christians that are believers in Christ but are not doctrinal in their thinking. Everyday thinking is going through a grid of doctrine. They are thinking doctrinally. In other words, they have a biblical mentality that is spirit-taught. They are thinking in regard, in reference to God in everything that they are looking at. Their lives have not only been changed by way of justification. These two words are important. Uh, justification. This is another word for salvation, you, you are saved once, and it's done and finished. And the second word is sanctification. This is pro- progressive. This happens in your life in process. You are, you are uh, actually declared righteous in justification, but you are experiencing righteousness by the Spirit in sanctification. You are a believer and you're saved by God's grace and you're destined to be just like Christ. He guarantees it in the mind of God. He determined that you would be without blame, blame, uh, would be, uh, without blame before him in love. This is a guarantee as to the ultimate a destiny of the born-again believer. We are secure in that. And yet, then, being a believer, 
my sanctification is very, it's very little. Am I thinking with God? No, I don't have those. I don't have any uh, special way of thinking except my natural common sense, my natural uh, disposition, my cultural background, the way my mom and dad taught me, or the way I learned in school or college, or my friends are teaching me. I'm just picking up on it by osmosis. I am not being sanctified. I am simply living a natural life. Archippus, take heed. It's a good word. Take heed. Be careful. Watch out. Be alert. Awake. Realize God has given you a ministry, and, and you should fulfill it. It should be happening that you are. So this is the second group of believers. They are the believers that are learning doctrine. This is what I want to share with you in Romans 6, a very important doctrine, and this has to do with our sanctification, and it is how it happens. A man might say, I am not disposed to being religious. I say, amen, I am not either, but I'm very interested in God. I'm not disposed to being moral or ethical or um, conservative or frugal or uh, determined or sincere or highly dedicated or very disciplined. And our answer to you is that you don't have to worry about those things primarily. What is most important is that you would know what God does for you. What does God do in this sanctification? That this operation of God in the believer happens as the believer hears what God has done for him, and then he um, believes it, and the Holy Spirit is the one that brings about these changes in our heart and in our mind. It's awesome. It's actually incredible. It is absolutely fantastic. Unbelievable, really, that you and I would become and be and become, be and also become holy. It's amazing. I am not able, Paul would say, but then he found he was able. I am not sure if I could ever do that, then he finds that he can. So now in Romans 6, we have a great sequence in this epistle of chapter 5, where he talks about the legal uh, element of two men only that have ever existed in history, the first Adam and the last Adam. There are only two. The first Adam sinned, and through him death. The last Adam never sinned, and through him comes life. This life is what God has given to you at your new birth. When you believed in Christ, you were born of his spirit. Then in Romans chapter 6, we have some words in the front end of the chapter on the fact that we have died with Christ. Look at chapter 6, and we could start reading from verse 5. <clears throat> For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man... The old man is the first Adam. Also, we could say regarding the first Adam, sin nature. For when Adam sinned, the sin affected him in his body, his soul, and spirit. 
three parts to man. His sin affected his body, and we have that today in our bodies, by the way. Our sin is in our body. Our mortal body, the apostle says. Mortal body, meaning not the soul, not, a, not the immortal body, but our mortal body has sin in it. Then the fall, or the sin of Adam in the garden, he feared, was ashamed and guilty, and hid himself. And so the old man is like that today. The old man hides from God. God says, hello, and the old man doesn't respond. He is a sinner, or sin dwells in us, and we know this. I was on the plane one day, and I was talking to the man sitting next to me about God. He didn't seem interested. I brought it right to him. I said, if God was behind that curtain on the plane, and he told me to come here and say, he wants to meet you, go and see God, would you go? Looks out the window, thinks about it, no. He wouldn't go. Well, are we surprised? No. The sin nature of man is not seeking God, does not care about God. Isn't it a marvel sometimes in our Culture, how little is talked about God. How ma ma many people are afraid of God. Many times um, it's a scary idea uh, for people that are just living their life in their own context. This is the old man that we know about, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Well, that's fantastic that Jesus died, but it's even greater that our old man died with him. The power of the old man, the nature of the old man, the reality of the old man is crucified with him. Verse 6, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Where another word for the word serve in the Greek there is slave. It is to be not simply a servant like a hired servant, but a slave with no options. This is the problem that we have as people they sin and they have no options. When you see on the television angry people on the street or at the university, uh, people teaching uh, anti-Christ thoughts or God anti-God ideas or movies that are anti-God or anti-Christ, don't be amazed by that. This is the nature of the world that we live in. Don't be surprised that people are a slave and serving sin. It's in our DNA. It's in our nature. It's not surprising to us. And here we have very important text. This is an amazing word. And the Apostle Paul being able to go right at it and describe what it is and then lead us through these chapters in doctrinal thinking. Now, the apostle is able to make a case, then rehearse it, and then go further. We'll see that in his verses here. Verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. There it is. That's so amazing. No classroom teaching did it. The cross did it. Jesus sitting down with his enemies and having long discussions did not do it. The cross did it. God consoling the sinner and stroking him in uh, caring for his flesh and sympathizing could not do it. 
but the cross did it. Now, like long discussions of psychological discourse and understanding compassion and all of that did not do it, the cross did it. Hallelujah. And to be honest, I would like somebody that's spirit-filled and doctrinally sound to be firm with me in regards to my flesh. I would like somebody to be very definite with me so my flesh can't get away with anything. I would like the cross to be in the pulpit, the cross to be in my personal heart because we are deceitful people in our hearts. Churches that slide away from doctrine. Then you have Christians, no sanctification, no revival, no authority in their words, no authority in their heart, no authority in their prayers because it's just simply another form of humanism with Christian language. And we say, we believe in God, praise the Lord. Or we believe in God, let's be kind to our fellow man. We believe in God, let's understand people and so on. And we say, okay, but is there something shockingly holy that changes me? I was in Ireland, this is the funniest thing. I, thought, I heard a cassette tape, Velma, Velma G gave it to me. And there's a little interview, I think they were fifth grade boys, and they asked the boys in the class, who was John the Baptist? And the little boy said in an Irish brogue, you know, very thick, he, ah, oh, he was a shocking holy saint. <laughs> uh, I had to hear that over and over again, it was so funny. And who is John the Baptist? He in the classroom goes, he's a shocking holy saint. <laughs> okay. I believe that. I believe that there's something about God amongst us that is shockingly holy and awesome. That moves me. There's something amazing about Christ that is lost in the, in the blurry humanism of Christianity that is afraid of offending people and telling it like it is and no longer preaching about sin, no longer bringing conviction into the hearts of people. This is important because I need not only to know how bad I am and what has happened to me, but I need to know how good God is, how gracious he is, and what the cross means to me. Paul said, I glory in the cross. It is so amazing, the cross. Wow. Okay. Let's look at it. <clears throat> Verse 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Well, this is sometimes, I think, just on the reading of that, we think, okay, we died with Jesus, and then, Later, after my dull, boring life of 70 years of just hacking my way through and trying to be morally good and acceptable, that one day I will, be, I will uh, leave my body and go and be with Christ in the resurrection. Now, wait a minute. If he came and he did this, I'd like to know it now. If I've been raised with him from the dead, I'd like to have a taste of that now. Doesn't it seem sensible that if he did it and it actually happened, that there would be something new that would be for us in this lifetime, that it would be now, that we'd be raised with him now, that we were buried with him and raised with him and that our life would now have some smell or fragrance of resurrection now? Well, this is said through these chapters, 7 Eight, um, six, seven, and eight. And verse eight says it this way: the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead also quickens our mortal body. See, he didn't talk about resurrection body. He said it'll quicken our mortal body. I, I think it means not only they, when it's in the grave. It is a mortal body dead in the grave. It is a mortal body. But I also have the mortal body today. 
It will also quicken my mortal body that has sin in it. The body that has sin in it, in my DNA, and my sin is telling me you have no choice. This is actually, it's, it's, um, look at this <clears throat> captivity word, verse 723. We're moving a little bit. I want to stay in the text, but I look at verse 723. I saw another law in my members. Verse 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Verse 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's another message. And uh, we have an inward man, soul and spirit. It's immaterial, but it is the inward man. And there's a law in the inward man. That is operating. It's the law of life. And I delight in the law of God that is after the inward man. The inward man loves the law. He loves God's principle, the law of God. It has a couple meanings. I love the principles of God's mind, the truth of the law the word of God, the life of God in the word of God. The inward man loves it. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you because the law of God is greater than the law of sin. The law of life is greater than the law of sin that is working in my members. Look at verse 23, chapter 7. I See another law in my members. There's the law of the inward man, but I see another law in my members. Now, what do the words members mean? It means the parts of my organic body. The law working in my members, my stomach. I want food. My sexual uh, or organs, my hormones, my the members' sin is working, and sex is not sinful. Sex is God's plan, as is food and every other part of my uh, body. My body is a gift, but I see working in my body the the law of um, sin that is working in my body. And it keeps me at the point of the spear. This is the word captivity, verse 23. Warring against the law of my mind. That's another law, law of my mind. And bringing me into captivity. Now, the word captivity has the meaning of um, taken prisoner at the end of a spear. So we could say that the, the mortal body, which is sin in it, is taking me, here, here's me, at the end of a spear, I am taken captive by my sin. And my sin is saying, you have no choice. I, my sin in my body is saying, you have to. Or this is, this is the authority of your, the sin nature is saying, you don't have a choice. You are going to sin. Mm, wow, parked there for a little while. You are going to sin. This is, your, this is who you are. You have no choice. I have taken you captive. Your sin has taken you captive. Well, I think we should park there for a half an hour and hold it. And think about that. Really? Yes. My sin nature has authority. My sin nature is in my mortal body. And it can talk to me through my body. And tell me who I am. And, I, and the Apostle Paul is describing this very well. He is saying that there is the law after the inward man... And then there is the law of sin that is in my members. 
You follow this with me. The law of sin in my members is taking me captive. And I, I, he is saying, really, I don't know what to do. I am a wretched man. Actually, he says it here. Look at verse 23. Bring me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am. The word wretched means exhausted as a result of hard labor. We have it in the Old English, you wretch. Sometimes we have visual images of a man exhausted, collapsed, not taken care of, hungry, homeless, dressed in rags. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body? Look at verse 24. Who shall deliver me from the body? Of this death. Mm. Do you see that? Oh Lord, we pray that this would be good for us to hear and edifying for us. Lord, that we would not be surprised by our sin nature. We would not be surprised by the things that bubble up into our consciousness that are from our sin nature and even also from demonic projection. Oh, Lord, that we would understand what we are dealing with because the real issue in life is, is uh, first to be saved. The real issue is to be saved. Then having been saved, wouldn't it be amazing that I could be a doctrinal believer who is thinking the right way about who I am, what my privileges are, and what Christ did for me at the cross. If I was to realize, wait a minute, my sin nature is taking me at the end of a spear and saying that I am held captive and I have no option. Oh, wretched man, I am exhausted by this fight. I cannot handle these sin, this sin that comes at me. I'm so disappointed over periods of time when I'm wrestling with my sin nature and the failures that I've had through the course of my life. But there's two answers to this, and one of them is the most amazing. God is saying, even your sin cannot separate me from you. I love you. And I want you to know who my son is and what my son did for you. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? It, listen, you know what's going to happen one day? We're going to leave our body of sin. We're going to leave it. No more sin. No more fear. No more worry. No more guilt. No more disappointment. No more condemnation. No more worry about my future. No more struggle about my past. I'll be out of my body without a sin nature. And it will be me. It'll really be me. And it will really be you. One young old woman said to the preacher in the church, well, I recognize my husband when I go to heaven. And the preacher said, well, I don't think in heaven you'll be any more stupid than you are here on this earth. If you recognize them in this world, I'm sure you will there. <laughs> Listen, we will leave our body. Amazing. Oh, but now there are times I am wretched, exhausted, disappointed. I am so saddened by my sin resurfacing in my life. And it, and it holds me at the end of the spirit. And say, you have no option. That's the, way, that's the way it attacks me, governs me. That's how I hear it. That's what it is. It takes life. It, it says this. It, this is who you are. You have no choice. You are, you, are, you are living in a sinful body, and I reign. Sin reigns in the body. Go back to Romans 6 and read this with me, please. <clears throat> Romans 6, verse 
verse 6, 6, 6, we read it once, read it one more, knowing this our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That we would start now not serving sin, who is holding me captive at the end of a spear and saying, I am reigning. You have no option. And I say, wait a minute. There is an option. One of them is simply Christ. I thank Christ that he doesn't condemn me. Romans 7, 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 8, verse 1. Christ does not condemn me. There is no condemnation in Christ. We have been delivered into a, another kingdom. We've already passed from death into life. God is not imputing my sin to me, past, present, or future. God has already made a calculation in his mind. Even if I was a sin and sin more and sin more, it cannot change the mind that God has for me. The determined destiny that he's already decided in his own wisdom and his own will and that he had executed by his only son. So that even when I say, oh, wretched man, I'm so disappointed, and the spear is saying, I have no option, I feel like a wretched man, I'm addicted to a drug or pornography or lying or cheating or stealing, or I just dump, I'm down in the dumps day and night or however it is. It's like, oh, there's doctrine that teaches me. That doctrine is speaking to my heart. The doctrine is in the Bible. What should I say to this one with the with the spear in his hands. Go back to Romans 6. It says, <clears throat> verse 12, let not sin therefore reign. Reign. <laughs> Let's say it like that. Let not sin therefore reign. I couldn't do that rolling of the tongue, ours, until I went to Finland where I had to practice going around the house. You do that like a motorboat. Rain. <laughs> right now, sin. Rain. What does it mean? You have, listen, buddy, you got me at the end of the spear and you're holding me captive, but I got news for you. Sin is not raining, it is in my body. My sin, the sin is in my body this morning, it is there. You could say maybe latent. It is there. It's ready to take authority. It is there to rise up any minute and say, hey, I am here. I have the authority. I am reigning. <laughs> and we are saying we are not going to let sin reign in our mortal body. Do you understand what I mean? Huh. Wow. Look at verse 12. When us sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Yeah, it's lying to us. It says it has a right to reign. And all the lusts that are connected with our body and those lusts are also very powerful. Sin in our body is very powerful. You cannot control it. I think of it, Leviathan, in the book of Job, we have the Leviathan, who can take it on a leash? And the Leviathan is an Old Testament word. Or it, 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 we didn't have a word for dinosaur. They didn't use that word. I don't know when it came in, but a dinosaur. I mean, a big brontosaurus rex in the National um, Museum there, the um, Natural Science Museum. Huge monster. Can you take that? Dinosaur on a leash? Can you put it in a cage like a bird? Can you capture it? Can you put a hook in its jaw? No. That Leviathan is beyond our control. And so is sin that is in our mortal body. Our sin that is in our mortal body cannot be controlled by you and I. It had to die at the cross, be crucified with Christ. Indeed, it was 
Now it's lost, lost its right to reign, reign. It doesn't have the legal right through the cross to reign. It does. It rises up. It has the amazing power and authority. And by the way, we taught a week ago or two weeks ago, by the advantage of the law, the sin nature mingle. it links with the law and becomes very powerful, condemning you and me powerfully. Taking the law, the sin nature says, you shall not commit adultery and you shall not lie and not bear false witness. And, and in our nature, in our sin nature, we say, yes, that's correct. I should not do so. But somehow, I, I've become more, more alive to it. Sin becomes exceedingly sinful, Romans 7, 13, by the law. Hmm. See it there? 7, 13. Okay. Was then that which is good made death unto me, speaking of the law, you shall not commit adultery or bear false witness. God forbid sin that might appear sin working death in me by that which is good by the law, that sin by the commandment, by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. There's a rebellion that works in us by law. But Paul is going to amazing reality in this text. And he is saying that the cross has done something that you and I could never do. That the cross has taken our sin nature and we've been crucified with him. And now we live in a body, with, in our mortal body with death in it and sin in it. But it is not have the right to reign over my life and hold me captive at the end of the spear and say, you have no option. But we are rather capable of saying, oh no, haven't you heard of the cross? The cross is where you died. The cross is where the old man was crucified. The cross is where I have found a new life. And the Holy Spirit is faithful to us to teach and reveal to us that Christ reigns in us. Before it was sin reigns in us. But now we have found, no, it's true that Christ reigns in us. And I don't mean that we need to be like somehow it's extraordinary. It's actually, in the words of Watchman Nee, the normal Christian life. He wrote a book, The Normal Christian Life is victory over the reigning of our sin. Before God does things in stages, before we get out of our sin, he's going to teach us that he has authority over it while we live in a body of sin. He is teaching us this. We are being sanctified even this very moment. We are being sanctified in our life day by day by his great grace. We're experiencing his nature, his joy, his freedom. That is what our nation needs. You cannot hold your breath and think there'll be reformations or moral changes without the reality of a spiritual revival rooted actually in doctrinal teaching because we are the small flock that, is, that Jesus said in Luke 12, 20, it's the Father, for little flock, fear not. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. All we need is one good man, spirit-filled, going to work on a regular basis and knowing that he has a sin nature, but the sin nature does not reign over him. He reigns over it through Christ. All we need is a woman who's got five children and changing diapers, and sometimes the kids are hungry, and she consoles them and picks them up in her arms and loves them and brings them to the Sunday school and does the best she can in her circumstances, but she is spirit-filled. 
And she has found that sin is not reigning. Do you understand why I'm saying it like that? I, I want to make a point about that. It's there, but it doesn't have the authority over you. Put your spear away. Drop your spear. Or no, you don't even say, you are dead. What are you talking about? I don't hear. I hear nothing. I hear, I hear God saying to me, I am more than a conqueror. I am able. Look at Romans chapter 6 and we'll finish. It says, verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield your members, your stomach, glands, a hormone, blood, all of it. In, in a, a, I mean, there are very physical realities, I know that. But yielding on a regular basis, God is saying, don't turn your members over to unrighteousness, unto sin, and give a place to that. But yield yourselves unto God, who said you died, and now you've been raised. And you've been raised with him. Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members, instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin, verse 14, shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Mm. Well, there's a lot in there. I hope some sentences that we said kind of resonate in your heart and mind. I hope you feel that you've been fed from the pulpit by the Holy Spirit, from the doctrine, from what the Bible is saying, straight, clear, and simple. I hope you realize that your life is not, it's, it's shockingly amazing. We have been changed in the inside. We, have, we delight in the law of God after the inward man. We have found that doctrine has set me free from myself. And now we are free, and we are worshipers. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The people that kind of tiptoe around being polite all the time, and tiptoe around about being afraid of offending people, or tiptoe around in life and just care, make sure that they are correct in every way. That is, who cares about that? Everybody is like that. You are not like that. You have found the Holy Spirit liberty, where you are saying the things that are true and edifying and building you up. You've experienced, tasted the joy and the liberty of being free as a person. And you say, hallelujah, glory be to God. God is good to me because God is filling you and giving you the understanding that you are free from your sin. And if we are free, Jesus said, you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. And when you are free from me, you are free indeed. Indeed. Ah. Yeah, wow. And we, just to be free from ourselves is amazing. Amen. Amen. Okay, would you pray with me, please? Father, there are two categories of Christians. One, they are saved, but they don't live in doctrine. The other, saved, and they're growing in their faith. And it is shockingly awesome, handsome, revealing, profound, touching, beautiful, provoking, motivating, encouraging, the doctrine that sets us free. And, and the doctrine said, don't live subject to the spear that is putting it in your face and saying you have no choice. But no, we are saying, by your grace, we believe in you. Not only did you come that we would go to heaven, but that heaven would be on the earth for us. We would taste it and see it. Not only one day we will be raised without sin, but that we would now live in a body of sin and have victory over it 
by your grace, by your work at the cross. Anyone here listening, receiving Jesus, believing in Jesus this morning, put all your trust in him, please. Trust in him with all your heart. And then if you believe in him, then just follow him wholly with all your heart. He will show you that good land. He'll lead you in and out. He'll promote you. Archippus, take heed that you fulfill the ministry that you have received from God. That's our desire too, Lord. In Jesus' name. Raise your hand if you're accepting Christ this morning. Anyone at all, we want to give you that opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Raise your hand, please. Amen. Would you stand and greet one another as we finish with a song? Take that spear and break it over our knee, right? There we go, because sin doesn't reign in our mortal bodies anymore. Lord, we thank you for this message of hope in us, and uh, we're so thankful that uh, we're not captive to this, uh, uh, the things of this world and the things of our flesh. So, Lord, we just ask you to lead us in victory as we go out today. Bless the service at 11, our service tonight at 630. We thank you, Lord Jesus, just for your, uh, your moving uh, in us and among us. Amen.